Hi, I'm Jenny Shampoo. I'm the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Rosalind Franson Welch. Dr. Welch is the associate director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. Her research focuses on Latter day Saint scripture, theology, and literature. She's the author of Ether, a brief theological introduction published by the Maxwell Institute. As well as, numer uh, as well as numerous articles, uh, book chapters, and reviews on Latter-day Saint thought. Today we're talking about Ether 1 through 5, um, and Dr. Welch is an expert on Ether, having written a book on it. Uh, and the painting we're looking at is by artist Caitlin Connolly. It's called Holding Holy Things. Uh, it was done in 2019, and it's actually hanging here in the Maxwell Institute. So we're here uh, on campus, and. Um, at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute looking um, at the actual painting. Um, Dr. Welch, can you just tell us, first of all, how does this piece uh, interpret the scripture that we're talking about today? Yeah, so Ether 1 through 5, as our viewers probably remember, tell the story of the Jaredite migration from the old world to the new world, and it focuses on the prophetic figure of the brother of Jared. Um, and, and you probably know it's one of the most memorable stories in the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. where the brother of Jared is tasked with preparing his people to migrate a dangerous sea voyage um, and he has a series of problems to solve and he approaches the Lord with his problems and for some of them like how to build the barges that they'll travel in the Lord gives him the answer mm -hmm. but when it comes to the problem of how to illuminate those barges um, the Lord says what would you like me to do? How would yeah. you like me to help? And so the brother of Jared has to come up using his own ingenuity, his own skills. Um, he has to come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. So as you will remember, he, um, um, what, what's the word that's used? Um, he fabricates <laughs> in some way um, these glowing, th these stones, these smooth glass-like stones, and then he brings them to the Lord. And in prayer, he approaches the Lord um, with great humility and asks, um, for the Lord to touch the stones mm -hmm. to illuminate them. Yeah. And indeed, as you'll remember, the Lord hears his prayer and not only touches the stones to um, bring them to light, um, but also shows himself to the brother of Jared as well. This is such a powerful story. I think it um, invites everybody who reads it to liken it to their own lives. Mm -hmm. And I think Moroni, as he was translating this story from the Jaredite records, I think he probably recognized himself in it as he was working to create or to, to, to compile and redact scripture and knew that it had this important role to play in the latter days, mm -hmm. felt intense anxiety about it. I think that he probably took great comfort in knowing that he could offer his human creation to the Lord mm -hmm. who would then bless it and bring it to life as scripture. Um, and I think the story invites each one of us as readers to liken it to ourselves and to encourage us to rely on the Lord and to take our best efforts to Him and ask Him to touch them with His divine power and partner with us as mm -hmm. we bring divine power um, in partnership with our human abilities. Um, that's when God's work can get done. And of course, what Caitlin Connolly has done here in this, um, in this painting, which is called, as you said, holding holy things and then in parentheses the sister of jared oh thank you for remembering that. yes yeah. she's <laughs> this the subtitle is sister of jared so she has imagined here a woman the sister of jared who is holding these stones and so um, Connolly is explicitly inviting us um, and affirming that women too have access to this divine power in our lives that God has promised to partner with us and to bless our best efforts as well um, to bring to pass his work in the world. Oh, thank you. Can, can you contextualize this piece in terms of the larger tradition of LDS thought? Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about this, um, and it's so striking to think of the sister of Jared. First of all, the character of the brother of Jared is so interesting because yeah. we in, in scripture, we're never told his name. Right. He only ever appears <laughs> as a brother. Um, and, it, and it relates to a larger um, tradition of brothers in the Book of Mormon. This category of the brother plays an important role, not just in the history, not just in the stories, but I think there's a kind of theological meaning to it as well. Um, a wonderful scholar named Sharon Harris has written about this in her book, um, A Brief Theological Introduction to Enos, 
Omni and Jerem, the, the small books <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the Book of Mormon. But she talks about the way that brotherhood works. From the very beginning, if you remember, Nephi is told um, by the Lord that his own descendants and, and progeny will perish. They will not survive to see the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. So all the work that Nephi is doing and that his um, own descendants in the Nephite scribal tradition will be doing to preserve these plates are going to be for the benefit of essentially his nieces and nephews, right? Not his own line. So he's not working for his own direct benefit, but for somebody else's benefit, for the benefit mm -hmm. of the world. And I think that that's a theme that continues throughout the Book of Mormon, asking us, using this category of the brother, to think about what it work means to do God's work faithfully, but not for our own direct benefit, mm -hmm. but for God's larger purposes. And that can be really hard to do. I can just put myself in, in um, Nephi's position there, right? Mm -hmm. um, or put yourself in the brother of Jared's position. Here he is. You know, this pivotal figure, he never even gets named in the Book of Mormon, right? He yeah, always right. just appears as the brother of Jared, but yeah. he's doing it for the benefit of, of his brother's people. Mm -hmm. So I love this idea of the sister of Jared because, once again, I think it invites us as women to read ourselves into that theological theme in the Book of Mormon and think about ourselves also as actors who are called and called upon um, to act for the greater good um, and to, to bring God's work to pass in the world, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all. That's really beautiful. I, so in addition to it being um, the sister of Jared and, and how that's different from every other portrayal of the story that we see, what, what are the sort of design elements that stand out to you as unique here? Well, of course, our eye is drawn to the, the beautiful glowing stones here at the center. And there's kind of this radiating light that you can see almost like a halo mm -hmm. in these circular patterns that, that emanate out from the center. So that's where the eye goes. But I will say I was also really struck by her hair. The strong balancing the light here at the middle is this dark, um, hair of hers that appears to me to be blowing in a very yeah. strong wind, right? Yeah. There's something that's pulling her hair to the side and it looks like the wind. So as I think about this in what might be the situation here, right? What has the artist imagined? Um, is it possible that the sister of Jared here um, is standing on the shore the, the, the storms and gales and winds that are going to blow the Jaredites from the old world to the new world, from the dark to the light, from the old life to the new life, um, have already begun. And so she's standing here already in the midst, exposed to the winds and the storm, and maybe she's going to deliver the stones to the barges and to distribute two of them to each of the each of the um, of the eight Jaredite barges, um, we don't know, but but that's what the 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 um, hair suggests to me, and it makes me think further about the theme of wind in the Bible, and we mm -hmm. see wind often connected to the presence of God as a kind of theophany. Um, and in Genesis one, in fact, maybe our viewers remember that um, the very first sign of creation is when the breath of God, which is pictured as the wind, moves upon the dark waters. And mm -hmm. that's the first beginnings of God's work to create the cosmos. So for me, um, and Jesus, of course, said um, to Nicodemus that um, the, the, the spirit or the wind blows where it will. God's, God um, sends his spirit forth upon the land to accomplish his purposes. So I see um, the wind that's blowing her hair as a partner to the stones that she's holding, both indicating the power of God through the agency of the spirit. Oh, wow. In, in your book on Ether, um, which I highly recommend, uh, you give a really interesting reading of how the 16 stones might relate to Moroni's textual project of producing these scriptures. Um, and you'll have, to, you'll have to read the book to, to see the, the full fabulous um, case that she makes there. But essentially, um, it presents a, a sort of reader-centered theology of scripture. And I wondered if you see in this piece any um, sort of viewer uh, privileged um, uh, um, experiences here. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that connection. What I, what I believe is happening in the book of Ether is that Moroni 
is trying to figure out what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He knows he's inherited this project from his father to, to complete and redact and edit um, and compile and translate the records into the finished record of the Book of Mormon. And they know that it's going to have this incredibly important role in the latter days. Um, and I think he's really struggling with how to make this happen. And he, he says that he's weak in writing and um, he, it, it is hard for him to believe that what he's producing here with his human imperfections on display is going to be able to step into the role that God has for it. Mm -hmm. And I think what the Lord teaches him is that scripture becomes scripture not because of what Moroni is going to do, although he has to do his work well, mm -hmm. but scripture becomes scripture when a reader who is touched by, the, mm -hmm. by charity through the grace of God opens the covers of scripture and reads it. Yeah. So scripture is a very personal thing um, that, that emerges in the relationship between the text and the reader. So when I look at this, I'm struck by the very personal feeling of the gaze between the sister of Jared and the stones that she is holding. Um, I was curious. I, I wondered maybe why she wasn't looking up. You know, why are her eyes cast down? So I went to the Book of Mormon art catalog and I <laughs> used the search filters and I pulled up a bunch of images of the brother of Jared holding the stones okay. to see whether most artists show him looking up towards Christ mm -hmm. or looking down towards the stones. And it turns out it's pretty much split. Okay. <laughs> so this is a really interesting moment where yeah. the, every artist has to make an artistic choice. Yeah. Am I going to show him looking up or looking down? Um, here, of course, she is looking down. And as I, I, have, I have looked at her face and, and tried to feel what the artist wants us to feel, and I see um, wonder and awe, but I also see fatigue in that face. <laughs> I, see, um, I see gravity in that face. Mm -hmm. And what it reminds me of, again, as I make this personal and as I strive to encounter God, whether I'm opening the scriptures or I'm meditating on this painting, um, what I see is the gaze of a mother looking at a newborn child. Oh. Oftentimes, you know, m mothers will hold their infants in that way, supporting their heads so carefully with the hands like that. There's often exhaustion in a new mother's face, yeah. but also love and awe as she looks down at this miraculous gift that God has given her. And as, wow. as a parent, you know, your, your child does seem to radiate light to you and you're, <laughs> yeah. you, you can't keep your eyes off of this mm -hmm. amazing infant. Um, so of course it d draws me to memories of my own mother, Christy Franson, who yeah. um, is a remarkable disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, she held, she holds holy things, um, both infants. She had 11 children, was an incredible <laughs> mother, but also was a powerful reader of scripture and a, and a scholar of scripture. Um, I was so proud of her growing up. She would be called on to speak at, at women's conferences and to um, answer gospel and scripture related questions at church and people look to her as an authority. Um, and I see that same kind of confidence mm -hmm. and quiet power, mm -hmm. assurance that she is known by God, that she has access to the power of God, and that God will partner with her own best efforts to bring to pass his work in the world. Um, that's something that I learned from my mother, and it's something that I see reflected in this beautiful painting by Caitlin Connolly. Oh, well, that is a beautiful testimony, and thank you so much for inviting us into the Maxwell Institute and chatting with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks, Jenny.